Hi, I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host for East Brunswick Television. Today, I'm here with Harry Camisa, the author of the book Inside Out, 50 Years Behind the Walls of New Jersey's Trenton State Prison, along with his co-author, Jim Franklin. Harry devoted his whole life to a career in one of the oldest and toughest state prisons in America. Yet at the same time, he managed to maintain a sense of humor and decency. Harry also had the good fortune to make friends with Jim Franklin, a professional writer who helped to bring Harry's story into print. I'm pleased that that book brings both prison guard and writer to our studio today. Harry, you started working at the New Jersey State Prison back in 1950. What led you to choose that career? What happened was I started in July 24, 1950. I was ready to get drafted into the Korean conflict. So nobody would have hired me. And my father happened to know the warden at the New Jersey State Prison. So he says, well, Harry, I'll get you in a prison until you get drafted. So I worked there to one year and then got drafted. That's how I originally got to go there. Uh, so when I come out of the service, I just automatically went back, never thinking I would stay there 50 years. Fair enough. And, and, and Jim, how did you come to be working with Harry on this book? Well, uh, when I first started teaching at Mercer Community College in uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it was the late 1960s. Uh, there was a, a gr Mercer had a grant to teach correction officers. Uh, they wanted to bring up the level of police and correction officers. So I went down to Trenton State Prison. I was in the firing range. I was in, the, in their firing range. They were all older than I was. I was in my late 20s. They were all in blue uniforms. And Harry was in my class. Oh. And that's how I met him. And then he got in touch with me. Oh, wow. Oh, about 30 years later. I would see him periodically, but uh, about 30 years later and said he wanted to write a book. And at first I said, good luck. I hope you <laughs> succeed. But he convinced me that I should help him, and I'm so glad I did. It's been a great experience. Yeah, it's a good partnership. Um, he has the experience. You have the writing skill. He tells you the stories. You write them up. Uh, it, seem, it seems like it worked out pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, Harry, when you started back in the 50s, uh, what was the ethnic makeup of the prison staff, say? The staff? Yeah, staff. It was mostly English and Irish, Anglo-Saxon. So, being Italian, we, you well, did Well, why aren't you in the mafia? Why aren't you booking numbers? Huh. You know how to put up with that. So, so, so your colleagues would razz you about being definitely, Italian? Definitely. Yeah, you know, yeah. that was part of the game. <laughs> but you took it. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I was used to it, <laughs> you know, I'm, I was. And I lived in the projects as a kid, and, uh, you know, Italians were not quite the ideal nationality <laughs> at the time. <laughs> they even razzed Joe DiMaggio, called him uh, the grease ball. Ah, uh, so, okay. <laughs> and, and so, um, what was the ethnic makeup of the prisoners? About 65% were Italian, because if you book numbers, you know, like they didn't uh, have the lottery, they didn't have Atlantic City. If you book numbers, you would get two to three, second time, three to five. So we had a few mafias in there for loan sharking and gambling, but it was about 65% Italian. Did, did you have better rapport with those prisoners on account of your being Italian? It, it, it had its advantages and disadvantages because they always wanted, hey, Harry, can you do this, can you do that? They wanted special favor. Sure. Yeah. I said, you're going to pay my pension? <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> okay. You witnessed some 13 executions? Yes. What was, what was it like, say, the first one? How did The first one, it was, his name was Theodore Walker. And he had, with a machete, killed a woman in the Trenton area. Her name was Molly Schlesinger. And he killed her with a machete. The thing was, back then, from the day he committed to the, mur the murder, there was no 10 years in a death house. They, uh, eight months later, he was electrocuted. Wow, so justice was swift. Real swift. Oh, okay. Real swift. The, the youngest inmate I saw get electrocuted was, his name was Joe Ernest, and he was 22 years old. He had done a bid in uh, Yardville. He had done three years. So when he got out, his girlfriend had sent him a dear John. So he got a gun, dyed his hair, and he killed her. Wow. So he was 20 years old. Uh, two years later, I witnessed him, witnessed him getting executed. And he walked into the death chamber. And what they did, the death chamber is about 20 by 30, painted a very dull gray. And they have, like where I'm sitting would be the electric chair. In front of you, they would have all the chairs. They were very similar to uh, funeral chairs, funeral homes yeah. back then with the wire in the back. And uh, there was approximately, I don't know, 50, 60 chairs. So you had the witnesses and the reporters and the officers would line up and back by the door with their nightstick. And everybody thinks it's a real, like, you know, like the Green Mile, which is not so at all. They give, they usually have four officers walk him in. They give him his last meal. They shave his head, they split his pant up the side, hook the electric up, and as they sit him in, they uh, put a wet sponge on his head, and everybody thinks they pull a lever. No, they spin a wheel huh. where, where he is electrocuted. Huh. And it's always a Tuesday night at 10 o'clock. By 10.04, 10.05, it's all over. Huh. You know, the the executioner will get nod and the warden will nod it huh. and that's it that quickly let me just say that he just said all of that in the present tense right yeah new jersey no longer executes <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, i'm i'm playing the english teacher here okay <laughs> yeah yeah very interesting and then another time you saw three young men executed in a single evening yes can you tell us a little bit about that well it, I, I imagine it was not much different, you know, yeah. except they brought him in one at a time. Wow. The Wise Brothers they brought in, and it, it's quick, you know. Yeah. But it's funny, the, the jail does get very, very quiet when that happens. What about movie depictions? Uh, did some movies stand out more than others as oh, being yes. accurate? Yeah. Shawshank Redemption, except the fiction part of The Warden, was as close as you will get to the way the jail was in 1950s, where cigarettes were everything, where swag would come in. And it's, everything is like that, yes. And, and then there's Denzel Washington in a hurricane? Uh, it was slightly exaggerated. <laughs> I'll be polite. Because <laughs> he always said he was down in a dungeon and no. Uh, John List, he was that guy who killed his whole family. What, what, yeah. do you, what do you remember about him? He worked for me. Huh. And he lined them up by size. He wrapped them in the rugs because he was an accountant. And he lined them up by size. And it's strange to say John List because Jim Franklin came in the institution and I introduced him to John List. And tell him what happened, Jim. John List worked for Harry. Harry was uh, a civilian employee at that time, and he ran the print shop. And, uh, well, you tell, uh, uh, tell Angus why you hired him. I hired him because I was in charge of doing 800 or 80 different forms for the prison, uh -huh. and he was the accountant. And we would do the forms, 
and he would handle them. And an officer come in, I want 50 sheets for charge reports or my daily count. He would measure them. He wouldn't give them more than, them, than the amount they had. So he was very strict, very stern. So that's why I hired him. But he was also very strange. And Jim, when Jim met him, he'll tell you why. So when uh, I went into the prison one day and Harry said, uh, come into the print shop and I'll introduce you to John Liss. And um, John had a, a desk. Uh, there was a room filled with paper, reams and reams of paper. And John's desk was there. And um, he was sitting behind the desk. And Harry said, John, I want you to meet a friend of mine, Jim Franklin. And John had all of his pens and pencils lined up. And they were in a descending order of length on his okay. desk. And I, and I knew this about how in Westfield, when he had killed his family, he had lined them up by the same method uh, in that order. So as, as Harry was introducing me, I shook hands with John. And Harry reached down, and he started moving the pens and pencils. And I, you know, I, after I taught prison guards, I went in and taught for two years. I taught inmates for two years. And this is the first time I saw anything like this happen. John kept looking down and looking up and looking down, and I saw a curtain drop behind his eyes. And I knew that if he had something in his hand, he probably would have stuck it in his neck. I, I, it, it was just madness that descended. And it was what, what, a frightening what, thing to see. What, what, he was angry about the pencils? Yes, he was oh, angry that he you, was, he you, was you, moving the pens and pencils. You, it, don't, you don't disrupt his forms. Yeah, his forms was, were. Uh, did, in order, I did, mean. Did you do that to provoke him, or was it? Yeah, I wanted to get a reaction. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you I, saw I the reaction. To, yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jim okay. paid the price. He had to watch that. <laughs> oh, okay. And what about this uh, Robert Biggenwald? Uh, Richie Biggenwald, next to Ambrose Harris, who killed that little girl in Trenton, Richie Biggenwald is the worst inmate I ever met in my life. He worked for me, too. Huh. Him and John Liss worked side by side. Uh, Richie Biggenwall repaired the typewriters. I got him that job huh. because we were paying 1000 a month to get re typewriters repaired and all. I said, heck, Richie Biggenwall could fix him. We bought him $600 worth of equipment. They said, hey, Harry, then he's your responsibility. I said, fair enough. So he. He was great with me. I got him the job, got him out of his cell. Very loyal to me. But he was as cold as his eyes. He had these clear blue eyes. You could see right through him. So he said, you know that John List, he's a bum. He killed his family. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Richie. You're a serial killer. You've been in jail. This is the third time you've been in for murder. You tied the woman to trees. He said, you know what the worst part of that was, Harry? I said, no, what? He said, when bugs bite, you can't scratch. That's how cold he was. But Ambrose Harris is definitely the worst inmate I've ever met. I mean, if Ambrose Harris's mother wanted that cup of water, no, he would, he would take it. Huh. And of course, I always give Ambrose Harris a little leeway. He was born in jail. His mother was in for murder. Mm. Huh. So, so these these prisoners like Richie Biggenwald or John List, did they enjoy prestige because they were so no, notorious uh, among the other well, inmates? Well, in in jail, it's really physical, you know. I mean, so the big guys dominate, or, more or less. Yeah, like the Ice Man. Nobody was going to bother the Ice Man. <laughs> and uh, the one inmate that's, that that's I Richard Kolinsky. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The ice man. Yeah. Nobody bothered him. You know, they knew he was cold. Uh, but the one inmate that I helped was uh, Teddy Roberts. Did you ever read the book? I, <laughs> I, I skimmed it. I haven't okay. read it. Okay. Well, I Teddy, Teddy yeah. Roberts was an inmate that I helped get his GED, 40 college credits, and he ended up having a, a job in Yardville and voted Teacher of the Year. I'll be darned. But he was the toughest physically, the inmate in the jail. He knocked out Reuben Hurricane Carter. Yes. Wow. So Kalinsky, did he exaggerate the number of victims? Oh, definitely. 
Yeah. I think I'm. 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 How can I prove it? Or, but where I'd bet money, I'd bet on it. Yeah. And being Italian, I would gamble. <laughs> <laughs> so he was. He was bragging about the number of victims. Yes, but it, he kept a very low profile in a prison. Uh. He really did because. I remember I was working the law library, and I said, okay, time to go. And he gave me one of the side looks. I said, I know, if I was in the street, you wouldn't put up with it, but you have to leave. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, 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 the prisoners who were working with you in the print shop, they enjoyed that because otherwise they'd just be in the, rotting in the, in the six cell. Six by eight, 22 hours a day. So, so they were loyal to me. My crew this, this, was very this loyal. Gave, this gave them um, a, a change of scene. If and, and they worked for me 10, 12 years, you wow. know. I, I, let me just say something else about Richard Bigenwald. He, I think, may be the only inmate in New Jersey who was sentenced to death under both forms of, uh, pun um, of capital punishment. He, when he was, I think he was, what was he, 17 or 18 years old? 18. 18. 18 he tried to hold up a, uh, a mom and pop deli in North Jersey, and he had a sawed off shotgun. And the son of the owners was working at night, happened to be a municipal prosecutor on the side, you know, and this was a side job. He was helping his parents. Bigenwald shot him with a shotgun and killed him. He was sentenced to death in the electric chair. And the victim's wife, uh, when, uh, when it came to the penalty uh, phase of the trial, the victim's wife said, please uh, don't execute him. There's been enough killing already. So he got a life sentence. Back then, a life sentence was 18 or 19 years old. He 14, got out. 14, 5. Or 18, 19. And so I'm he sorry. got out and went on this killing spree and killed at least six young women. That's why Harry referred to him as a serial killer. So he was sentenced to death a second time, this time for lethal injection, and the death penalty got struck down, and so he escaped twice. capital punishment twice, wow. two different forms. I want to talk a little bit about the rival gangs, the, the black nation of Islam versus the Italian mafioso. Can you fill us in on that? Well, they had a little trouble with, with the inmate that was with the mafia, Pussy Russo. And it was controlling the drugs that were in a prison. Uh -huh. And that's when the Muslims attacked Pussy Russo in a mess hall and stabbed him. But that went on. It was more than just him. There were a few Oh, yeah. It was, you know, three yeah. or four of them. They were, weighed, they were just were ready for him. And tell us about the first time that you were taken hostage. First time I was taken hostage was in 1975. I was the officer on the second floor of the school. Now, the officer's deck, desk is on the right-hand side. As you go up the steps to the second floor, it's in the middle of the classrooms. There's classrooms on the right-hand side, classrooms on the left-hand side. I'm sitting at my desk collecting passes. You have to get, take, get a pass to go to school. Collecting passes. And all at once I hear, in a prison, you hear shuffling of feet. There's no running or walking real fast in a prison. You hear shuffling of feet. I turned and looked at the right-hand side. At the end of the hall, the classroom was for black studies. And they had all young inmates in there. They were in their 20s. They had killed... Shabazz's lieutenant, they killed Shabazz, who was a lieutenant in the Elijah uh, Muhammad's era. Yeah. And this was a different sect. It was the, what the uh, The word? New Order, I believe it was The called. New Order, I think yeah. they called it. Well, there was five of them. So when I turned to look, one, the other inmates that were out to kill them had wood chisels, and they just put it to my throat. And they said, don't move. I said, whoa. And I hit the riot bell. I said, hi. I said. But nobody came up real fast. Huh. And what happened was, as they were running by, they were stabbing them. 
and the faster you run, like the wood chisel was just taking pieces out, and the faster you run, the more the blood shoots out. And it happened to shoot on one of the classrooms where these two elderly women had just came as teachers. They both quit right <laughs> then and there. And after it was all over, I was the, ended up the only witness. The other three officers that were on the first floor said they didn't see anything. They, you know, they were worrying about getting the teachers out of the way. Uh. So I had 24-hour watch around my house <clears throat> with the officers. And my youngest son was in Princeton Day School on a scholarship, and they had an officer sitting outside the classroom with a gun. I said, uh oh, there goes the scholarship. But they never did take okay. it. They put up with that. You were taken hostage a second time. Yes, I was taken hostage in 1985. Well, ten years later. Yes, to the year. <laughs> <laughs> once as an officer, once as a teacher. There was no discrimination. <laughs> so, anyway, the second time I was held hostage was an inmate had come up for classification, and the principal of the school, Doug Heil, said, you got to go work in the tailor shop. He said, I don't want to work in the tailor shop. I don't know anything about That's where you're going to go. You don't have a choice. You're in jail. So he went back to his cell. He brooded over it. He went in the mess hall. He got a ladle. He ripped the round part off, filed the edge of the handle. And I was in the school area, and he came in. He said, all right, get in the office. So he put in my website. So I started running the office to tell the principal, hey, you know, he's after it. too late. He was in a room with us. And uh, we were held in there till that evening. Oh. And there was five of us held in there. Wow. And uh, what about the window? Oh. <laughs> so there was a window there. And uh, the inmate Jones, he said, hey, I don't like you, Dave. His name was Dave Parrish, the other officer. Uh, social worker, he said, move over, Harry. So I went like this. You could take the stand there because they had a sniper in the roof. I moved away from the window. Uh -huh. He became warden at Yardville, and when I went to work there, I'd walk down the hall and go, don't be wise, Harry. I would give, <laughs> give him, you could stand by the window. But you know, it was funny. My daughter's a speech pathologist, right? Yeah. She didn't want her to go to work. She wanted to stay home and raise their children. I said, that's all well and good. But your resume will say you wash dirty diapers. I get you in a prison one day a week, nine to two. I lined up three prisoners. One stuttered, one had a tongue thrust. And Barambo, there's a chapter yeah. on him in the book, had a couple bullets in his head. I said, they know that I was a prison guard for 30 years, Kim. They'll be good to you. You'll be on the second floor. I'll be on first floor. Well, I don't know. I said, look, Kim, I told you. I warned them they better treat you. She said, well, all right, Daddy. So I said, first, I'm going to take you out for lunch. The place was built in 1835. Andrew Jackson was seven. It's funky. I'll take you out for lunch. We came back at 1 o'clock. I said, okay, now, Daddy has a class downstairs. You'll be on the second floor. Okay, Daddy. School out, about 80 prisoners, because there was 1,900 at the time. And about 80 prisoners go to school. They came out. They went upstairs. Quarter after one, everybody out of the school, everybody out of the school. My daughter was there four hours. She said, what's going on? Never mind. She leaves, gets home. Daddy's being held hostage. Huh. So when I got released that evening, I called her. I said, Kimmy, da Daddy, I quit. So <laughs> she has the shortest career, four hours. I got the longest 50 years. <laughs> uh, Jim, I want to pitch it to you. Tell us a little bit about the process of, of producing this book. How, how, how did it work out? Uh, it was uh, interesting. Uh, at, at first, I started uh, taping Harry. Uh, he's a great storyteller. I can see. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I started taping him, but th uh, that was cumbersome. It was taking too long, so I just uh, basically took notes. And uh, we met. Uh, uh, I would go over to his house for dinner every Friday, and we would 
eat and then talk about this, and he would tell me story after story after story. Uh, and then uh, I realized that while the stories were interesting, I didn't think that there was an entire book in the stories. So I decided I'd better research what these inmates did to get them into the prison. And um, I went to uh, my administration, and they gave me a sabbatical because I wanted to check everything that he was telling me. Even though I trusted him, I just wanted to make sure that all of the details were correct. And he was spot on with everything. Remarkable memory. Uh, the only thing, he couldn't remember exact dates that things happened, but if I had a name, because of the location of Trenton and, and New York City, the New York Times had a, uh, it was part of the New York Times coverage area. And as an academic, Angus, you know, you will remember that the New York Times had a bound, uh, had, had, uh, we could look up. It was the only newspaper that, where we could actually look up uh, a name and find the date that it appeared in the newspaper. So I was, and once I found out from the New York Times, uh, the New York Times might run a little clip on it, but the Trentonian and the Trenton Times would run stories like this. And so I was able to go to the State Library, I researched, and everything that he told me, everything was absolutely spot on. Huh. So I want to tell you, when I first started as an officer, 21 years old, I came home from work. I lived right down the same street yeah. as the prison. I just walked to work. So I came home, and my mother said, Harry, hurry up. You got to go in the Italian neighborhood, which was the Berg. Go to the Nabilidan Hall. My father was from Naples. But the Nabilidan Hall, they gambled. So I forgot I had the uniform on. We're dressed just like a cop. <laughs> I knock on the door. What do you want? Someone to see Ralph Camisa. We don't know any Ralph Camisa. I said, A.B. All Italians had nicknames. You know, I said, hey. You see the name, Camisa? It's my father. Said, hey, Abe, you're a kid here. He's a cop, for Christ's sake. <laughs> like that was, you know. They, they thought you were going to bust up the game. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Jim, a, a follow-up question. Do you have any plans to turn this wonderful book into a documentary film? We'd love to. Uh, and uh, interestingly, an, an inmate, um, we were selling the book at the Italian Fest in Mercer County. And an, an ex-inmate came by and uh, started a conversation with us and asked that same question. And he said, by the way, my nephew is in the film producing business. So uh, the inmate uh, put us in touch with his nephew. And we've been going back and forth with him for a couple of years uh, on that very subject. And we're hoping that something will come from that. Well, that'd be nice. Yeah. 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 And, and I remember. Joanne Chesimard, that was a very uh, famous oh, yeah. case. Uh, she was involved with the shooting of the state trooper uh, yeah. right here in East Brunswick. That's right. And, um, and, and then the, one of the members of her gang uh, tried to... Uh, got uh, shot. In, well, he got away in Trenton. Yeah. But one of them got killed, Clark. Yeah. One was killed. Uh, right. There was a gunfight. Yeah. Well, no, I meant before that. On the turnpike itself, when the oh, yeah. state police pulled the car over, that was the Black Liberation Army. Huh. And when yeah. uh, the trooper, Werner Forrester, pulled right, right here in New Brunswick where the, um, the New Jersey uh, Turnpike Authority is, there's a slope, a long slope down to the turnpike. Yeah. He stopped him right there, and they opened fire on him. And he was, he was uh, fatally wounded. Uh, but he returned fire, and another one of the Black Liberation Army members in the car was hit. Uh, they took off down the turnpike. They got, oh, I think maybe 10 or 12 miles down, and the one who was hit bled out, and uh, he got out of the car, but he collapsed on the side and died. Uh, Joanne, was, Joanne Chesimard was also wounded, and they captured her, and then a third one took off through the woods, and they eventually captured him, and that was Clark Squire, uh, and he, yeah. got, he went to Trenton State Prison. And, and they tried to break him out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Harry, I want to thank you for uh, coming out. Hey, and, uh, my Jim, pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Angus. Wonderful book. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you. Okay.